I'm looking towards some of my favourite matches or just bouts that intrigue me and I want to write a bit about for some inspiration, putting them in a bit of context, going through them and so on. Hopefully you'll get a kick out of it as much as I will. And we start with one of my favourite Noah matches, a classic and quite different match pitting one of the company's great mid noughties darlings against someone who hated the company and everything it stood for. Kenta vs Suwa from 2005. How are we going to go about this then? Well, this is a title fight. The GHC Junior Heavyweight Championship is on the line, so we should look at the belt's history in and around the match itself. We can go back to reports at the time as much as possible to see the build-up to the big bout, and then naturally after looking at the match itself, we can check some of the aftermath to see what happened next. There's a nice chunk of good things to go through, and it's always fun to look at a pair of wrestlers like these two. I mean, they certainly weren't boring. They were magnificent in two very different ways. So with all that said, let's go back to 2004, a little over a year before this match. On July the 10th, 2004, Noah held their biggest show to date, Departure, their first Tokyo Dome show, headlined by GHC champ Kenta Kabashi against Jun Akiyama in an epic feud-defining clash. Such shows also provide a chance to tie a ribbon around some other lengthy stories, and that certainly happened in the junior division. Since the start of 2004, the junior belt had been held by an outsider. No lesser name than Jushin Thunder Liger, who was working here at the time as the head of New Japan's CTU group. Liger defeated various contenders in the first half of 2004, ranging from Makoto Hashi to Kataro Suzuki, Noah's first-born native wrestler, before taking on Yoshinobu Kanemaru at the Dome Show. Kanemaru was a part of Junakiyama's Sternness stable, and had been at Noah since the beginning, one of the many who jumped ship with Misawa and company, frustrated by the lack of opportunities in All Japan for anyone who wasn't a traditional heavyweight. Kanemaru was also, notably, the very first GHC Junior Heavyweight Champion. He was crowned on June 24, 2001 after defeating Pathfinder Tsuyoshi Kikuchi and eventually Juventud Guerrera in a tournament. With Liger being one of the greatest wrestlers of all time, and certainly one of the most decorated juniors there has ever been, you might have expected him to treat most of his adversaries in Noah with a fair bit of contempt. And you'd be right. Liger's Noah reign saw some of the very best shit-eating, sarcastic, asshole Liger content you can find. The clapping at opponents' shortcomings, the stretching out of limbs, the cold cock shote palm strikes to the chins of many. The match against Kanemaru certainly started out the same way, with Liger barely treating his opponent as an equal. However, Kanemaru revered the storm and kept coming back at the legend until finally, at the end of an excellent 17-minute match, Kanemaru chained together two of his signature touch-out spinning brainbusters and kept Liger's shoulders down for the free count. The inaugural GHC Junior Champion had regained the title for Noah, beginning his third reign with the belt. Quietly, Kanemaru had been the dominant force in the early years of the junior division. He was starting his third reign, and no one else had won the belt more than once. However, another junior was coming up pretty fast behind him. Kenta was another wrestler who came in from AJPW, dating from the last months before the big exodus. He debuted four years after Kanemaru, who started out in 96. He showed potential pretty quickly, moving up the ranks fast. He was a part of Kabashi's burning group and had made a couple of attempts at winning the junior title. Initially, he entered another junior tournament in 2002 that followed Naomichi Marafuji's vacation of the title due to injury, and he got all the way to the final, defeating Kataru Suzuki and Tsuyoshi Kikuchi before losing to Kanemaru. Then he ended up teaming with Marafuji from 2003 onwards. The pair would become the inaugural junior tag team champions after defeating Liger and Takehiro Murahama in another tournament. The team of Kentamaru, as they soon became known, would be regular show stealers. They would always be in incredibly exciting, fast paced tag matches, and the crowd would go more and more wild for them. Hell, it could be said that Kenta Maru established something of a blueprint for junior tag wrestling that would last many years, when it comes to fast and fluid double team action, high wire sequences, an abundance of super kicks, plenty of stuff like that. 
Kentar's performances were rewarded in late 2003 with a set of trial matches against some of the biggest wrestlers in the company, crossing the line to take on heavyweights. He would only win one of these trials against Juventud Guerrera, but he showed a lot of fire even in defeats to the likes of Junakiyama, Genichiro Tenryu and Yoshihiro Takayama. It was during this trial series, in an excellent match against no lesser figure than Mitsuharu Misawa, that Kenta would introduce a new weapon that he'd innovated. After blasting Misawa with his signature running Busaiku knee strike, he placed him on his shoulders and dropped him down to the mat, interrupting Misawa's face with his knee. This new move, the go to sleep, came within milliseconds of putting the legend down, and even though Misawa ultimately prevailed, Kenta's new finisher was very much established. On the same Tokyo Dome show where Kanemaru defeated Liger, the team of Kentamaru would defeat the team of Kendo Kashin and Takeshi Sagura, just another successful defence in a list of many, as they held an iron grip on the junior tag titles for 690 days. Finally, Kento and Marafuji would lose the titles on June the 5th, 2005 against Kanemaru and Segura, with the more muscular Segura pinning Kenta. The more crucial thing about this loss, perhaps, was that it would finally free up the ever more popular Kenta for another tilt at Kanemaru's junior title, which he'd steadily held on to for a year since the Liger victory. Kenta would take on Kanemaru at the group's second Tokyo Dome show, Destiny, on July the 18th. Once again, the pair would produce an excellent match. Kanemaru was certainly game for a fight here, although it was thought to be pretty obvious in the build-up that Kenta was going to use this big occasion to dethrone Kanemaru at last and ascend to the top of the junior heavyweight division, something that he'd been utterly primed for over the past year or so. Inevitably, after blasting Kanemaru with a Busaiku knee, at last he would win his first GHC Junior Heavyweight title. By this stage, Kenta was one of the most over-wrestlers in the whole company, loved by just about all the fans, particularly the younger ones. His first challenger would be someone who'd come in from the outside, who hated everything about the company and all of its tradition, and particularly detested the new champion. So, here's the background behind a man who is, well, still probably one of the most underrated heels in wrestling that there's ever been. It kind of feels that any list of the great heels that doesn't mention Suwa is just incomplete. He's an absolute artist when it comes to getting heat, as we'll soon see. Anyway, Suwa originally debuted in 1997 as one of the first trainees of the legendary Ultimo Dragon, and accordingly he'd spend most of his first seven years wrestling for Ultimo's Toriumon promotion, first off in the initial 97 Mexico setup, and then in the Japanese promotion from 1999. You might actually have seen Suwa if you were an avid watcher of WCW back in the day. Billed as Judo Suwa, he wrestled on TV for them a few times circa 1998 and 99 in squash matches, where he was always on the losing end. Still, it was in Toriumon where he established his name as the Indy Got Hotter. He was an absolute shit of a heel, and he had a place in the Crazy Max faction, alongside the likes of Seema and Don Fuji. However, Toriumon didn't last forever. In the summer of 2004, after Ultimo Dragon came back from his year-long break to wrestle in WWE, he decided that he was going to leave his federation and gym behind, taking the name with him. Not that the promotion died as such, it immediately changed its name to Dragon Gate, and it's still one of the top indie promotions to this day. Suwa was dealing with a minor injury at the time of all this drama, but he wrestled on a number of the first Dragon Gate shows before deciding to sign up full-time with Noah in September of 2004. Now Suwa's healing antics would take place on a much bigger stage, and it wouldn't be too long before he'd find his bet noir in the shape of that tipped-for-the-top pretty boy known as Kenta. Just a month into his run, Suwa would team with junior mainstay Ricky Marvin in an unsuccessful attempt to wrest the junior tag belts from the grasp of Kenta Maru, and in the utterly hateful exchanges between Suwa and Kenta, the feud between the two was sown, and the stage was set for what would take place 11 months later. Before that though, the pair would actually have their first singles match on the 24th of April 2005. 
The heat between the two was already considerable, and there wasn't even time for introductions. Kenta rushed Lorin to get the bout underway. There was a lot of hype for this first encounter, but the action here would end up being good, but brief. After only a few minutes, Sura quickly resorted to fouls in order to get the upper hand. Then he would fish under Lurin and find himself a briefcase. After a bit more back and forth, that briefcase would be chucked directly at Kenta's face, with the result being a disqualification. Sura continued the beating until Takashi Sagura and Kanemaru rushed in, seemingly stopping him. However, this too turned out to be a ruse, and they'd hit Kenta with an Olympic slam and backdrop respectively, joining forces and teaching Kenta something of a harsh lesson. The short length of this match was seen as a bit disappointing at the time, but in the context of the feud, it makes perfect sense and sets up a lot of story points. The briefcase would quickly become a friend to Sua, and something that would frequently accompany him to Lorin. The immediate result of this post-match attack was an excellent and very hateful six-man match on the 3rd of May between Kenta, Ricky Marvin and Loki, and Sura, Sugura and Kanemaru. Definitely another match that's worth watching, and only adds further to the intensity in this feud. But ultimately things do pick up again on July 18th, after Kenta won the title from Kanemaru. Immediately after winning the title, Kenta would challenge Sua for his first title defence. There is, after all, a great deal of unfinished business there, and Kenta wants to settle the score, even if he has ascended to the top. It's not as if Sua didn't deserve it by this point. Even if he'd claimed to hate all that Noah stood for, and he didn't even particularly care about winning and losing, he was unquestionably one of the top challengers in the division. He had a powerful offence with lots of signature moves, from his electric chair face buster to his bombastic John Woo dropkick, and his finisher, an elevated version of the pedigree known as the FFF, which, yes, it stands for fucking fucking fucking, or something along those lines. Of course, all of this great offence was supplemented by the guy using every dirty trick in the book. Referee distractions, low blows, closed fists, chokes, boot scrapes, foreign objects. There was nothing that Sewer wouldn't do. With Kenta's challenge in place, the stage was quickly set for a war between these two that would finally settle the score, taking place at the Nippon Budokan on the 18th of September, the final show of Noah's second Great Voyage 2005 tour. It would become one of the most universally loved matches in the company's history, particularly from the company's most popular era. With admittedly not a whole lot else on this second Great Voyage card beyond a lacklustre Takeshi Rikio title defence against Misawa, and a pretty decent semi-main pitting Kenta Kabashi and Akira Tawe against Genichiro Tenryu and Junakiyama, a match to build up Tawe for his eventual successful takedown of Rikio's reign as it turned out, it's not too difficult for Kenta and Sua to completely steal this show, but the match that they produce is one of the best that either man ever had in their career. A phenomenal display of high-octane action mixed with storytelling that doesn't just call back to the earlier points in the story, but stands up simply on its own if need be. You can already tell something's different in the air when Sua struts to Lurin, briefcase in hand. There's no in-ring rushing to kick this one off. We get the usual title match preamble, complete with Joe Higuchi reading out the GHC title's declaration, until Sua snatches it from him and tears the sacred document to shreds. Finally, after a slight fracas during which Sua does tell Joe Higuchi that he's number one, the introductions are made, the bell's won, and the match begins. Two minutes after this, the match would end. There's certainly no slow burn here. The pair go straight at each other with strikes, with Kenta taking the advantage, until Sua goes to recoup on the outside. But Kenta naturally won't let him, rushing him into Laurel's, and then bashing his head on the timekeeper's table. But doing this naturally puts Sua within reach of a foreign object, and a few seconds of hesitation is enough for Sua to blast Kenta with the ring bell. And he's not done. Sua retrieves the case from under Lorin, rolls Kenta back in, and then... Boom! Once again, Sua slams the case into Kenta's face. Despite a final warning from the ref, he pushes him away, and then smashes him again. And the ref calls for the bell. It's a disqualification win for Kenta in 1 minute 34. Not that Sua even remotely cares, he's raising his arm as if he's won. 
Because, well, he has in his mind. He's done exactly what he set out to do. Now, this is just an amazing step for the sewer character, really. You sometimes have characters in wrestling profess that they don't care about results, but that doesn't always come across when the chips are down in a big title match and suddenly it's the fight for their life. Now this match right here is unquestionably the biggest match of Sewer's career. Nothing else comes close. And he ends it in a minute and a half just because he wanted to beat up on Kenta some more with his weapons and make a complete mockery of Noah, treating the entire process and ritual of these title matches with contempt and disdain. He actually truly does not give a damn. Sewer struts up the ramp, revelling in what he's done. However, He's in for a surprise. Kenta sure as hell doesn't want the match to end here, and nor does Joe Higuchi. Suddenly, the legendary ref and GHC representative is in the ear of the match's zebra, and just as Sewer's about to leave, the referee announces that another match between Kenta and Sewer is going to take place immediately. Even though Sewer still tries to fob it off and leave, Kenta rushes up the ramp to get him right back, dealing out a suplex on there and a couple more receipts for those briefcase shots. The fight is back on. We get back into the ring, but Sewer's soon back out after a running of the ropes to have a shouting match with Higuchi, and the ref even threatens to take his jacket off. <laughs> now that's quite the badass moment. Anyway, Sewer returns to the ring. Kenta still has the advantage and pours more offence onto Sua, draping him on the ropes, hitting kicks and a big slap to the back of the head. Things slow up briefly, but that doesn't mean the cheating stops. Sua reverses into a neck breaker drop, then takes off his wrist tape and chokes Kenta with it, attempting to hide it from the ref. Then we get more wonderful antics. Sewer tries to remove the padding from the turnbuckle, despite the ref's protestations. When he finally takes it off, Sewer whacks the ref on the arse with it, and then chucks the padding at Higuchi. Kenta recovers, and the two strike again, but Sewer nails an eye wake, distracts the ref, and then misses both Kenta's legs with a stunning foul. He turns around and kicks Tsuyoshi Kikuchi off the apron as he's trying to fix the turnbuckle, and as Kikuchi's held back by the referee, Sewer gobs on him. Jesus! All of this magnificent healing takes place in the space of a single minute. The turnbuckle does get fixed while Sua maintains control with kicks, punches and a tilt -a well backbreaker. The punishment continues outside with runs into the apron, the guardrail and more ball based offence. Sua picks Kento up and plants his groin directly into the ring post. The crowd boos him like hell, not that he cares much. Back in the ring, we get a pendulum backbreaker, but Kenta's finally able to reverse off an Irish whip and land a few of those lethal kicks to take Sewer down. He goes for his swan dive drop kick, but the ref gets a bit too close to Sewer, who seizes the opportunity and pushes him into the ropes, sending Kenta crashing down. Obviously, Sewer claims to the ref that he tripped because, well, he's Sewer. We get a backdrop for two and a camel clutch, naturally with some fish hooking to really bring it home. More hits in the corner, and Sewer distracts the ref yet again just so he can cold cock Kenta with a closed fist punch. A John Woo to the seated Kenta gets a near fall, but then Kenta's finally able to claw back offence, using his boot in the corner to stagger Sewer, hitting a Hurricane Rana off the top, followed by a running boot to send him reeling. A single leg dropkick knocks Sewer down, and Kenta finally hits the exquisite swan dive dropkick. He's getting his movement back, but that fluidity is paired with anger when Kenta pretty much stomps a mud hole on Sewer in the corner, Stone Cold style. Hesitation drop kick, but then an attempted boot in the corner is reversed and Sewer takes the opportunity for another quick foul. Back drops reversed and Kenta runs the ropes, but Sewer hits a flapjack for two. Sewer finds more intensity, and with it he takes more risks. He follows the flapjack with a clothesline off the top, and goes straight into a picture-perfect tope on the outside. A reminder that for all of the guys cheating, he can sure as hell go as good as anyone. Kenta rolls back in at 16, and a lariat from Sewer gets another near fall. Kenta again manages to reverse an attempted powerbomb and hit a kick, followed by his signature strike combo that usually sets up the Busaiku knee. However, Sue is able to reverse that and land one of his own favourite moves, the electric chair facebuster, for another near fall, the biggest one so far. 
We're really getting into the last stretches of the match as Suwa tries to set Kento up for the triple F, but Kenta's able to block and reverse into a Tiger suplex for a near fall of his own. Kenta tries for the go to sleep, but Suwa dodges, hits another punch and goes for the John Woo. Kenta reverses with Awana and tries for the knee, but gets Manhattan dropped and kicked in the nuts once again. Suwa finally does hit the John Woo and rushes to get Kenta out of the corner for another triple F attempt. However, Kenta's able to reverse that again and this time he does hit the go to sleep. However, after all of that, he's not able to go for the pin. The go to sleep is more to get Kenta some much needed time to recover. Finally, the two are pretty much reduced to striking at each other on their knees. They start to slug each other, but Kenta pushes away just that little bit and throws a soul butt which absolutely hits its mark, just below the midriff. Turnabout, at long last, is fair play, and the kick poleaxes Suwa. Three more absolutely savage head kicks send Suwa down, but only for a 2.9. Kenta readies himself and at last hits the Busaiku knee, but somehow Suwa isn't fully out yet, still trying to struggle up. A couple more absolutely massive roundhouses, a huge double one of the ropes, and then Kenta hits a gigantic Busaiku knee strike, one of his most vicious ones ever. Kenta basically lands directly on Suwa from the knee, covers, and at last he gets the free count. Kenta has finally managed to overcome this utterly hated rival. He may never be able to have children after this match, but he was able to successfully defend his hard-won belt and defend the honour of Noah against someone who was absolutely interested in little except pouring scorn all over it and making a mockery of the company even on the biggest night of his career. But even with all that in mind, Suwa still gave Kenta an absolutely hellish time and came incredibly close to getting the belt for himself. The reaction for this match was immediately pretty white hot. Most everyone on the internet utterly loved it for the storytelling and for just how much gold there was to be found in a match like this. Now by this stage we had been quite used to really great technical bouts from Noah, of course, but while the standard here was unquestionable, to combine that with all of the incredible healing from Sua, <laughs> that was special indeed. It made for a match with some off the scale heat and something that was certainly different from Noah but couldn't really have been executed much better, especially when you consider the whole story that had built up between these two virtually since Sua's arrival into the company. As much as 4 stars is a pretty good rating, I'm kind of surprised at that score from the Observer. I mean I would bump that up by another 3 quarters at least. For a fair few people, it's gone down as one of the best ever Noah matches, especially from the 2000s. I've seen it being called the greatest match in the history of the company's junior division, and even if I've not necessarily seen everything, it would take a hell of a lot to top this one, seriously. It's one of my favourites, and oftentimes, if I get to a stage where I don't feel that good about wrestling, and don't have much motivation to watch, this is the match that I'll think of, and the one that I'll put on. It'll remind me all over again why I love it so much. There is pretty good reasons why, of all the matches out there, I wanted to cover this one first. So what happened next for these two? Well, for Kenta, this was another memorable victory, and another step in his continued ascension. He was quickly getting a reputation as one of the most fun and best wrestlers to watch out there. There would be a few more tag meetings with Suwa along the way, of course, and they certainly wouldn't have any love lost for each other, but as for the title around his waist, well, he would hold that for nearly a year, finally losing it to Takashi Segura on June 4th, 2006. By this time, however, Kenta was already starting to mix it up with the heavyweights. He'd already had an incredible match against his mentor, Kenta Kabashi, after all. Kenta would continue to be a mainstay in Noah for many years, including some of the company's darker times, although he wouldn't actually win the big one, the GHC Heavyweight Championship, until 2013. He left the company in the summer of 2014 to wrestle in the WWE as Hideo Itami, a few years that would occasionally produce reminders of just who Kenta was, but was often frustrating and marked with a great deal of injury. 
After requesting his release in 2019, Kenta would sign with New Japan Pro Wrestling, eventually turning heel and joining with the Bullet Club as the worst intruder. The thing about Kenta is that in the 2010s people seemed to not think all that much about him as Noah disappeared more into the background even if he was still producing very strong work and his WWE one didn't actually do a lot to change that unfortunately. However, the last couple of years have most certainly seen him come back to his best and he is definitely quite the different beast now when compared to the younger fresh faced guy from 2005 who had all the younger fans screaming Kenta at him. As for Sua, well as previously mentioned this match against Kenta is absolutely his finest hour and his most high profile one. It is perhaps fitting that the match against Kenta would be the only time that Sua challenged for the junior heavyweight title, although a fair bit of that perhaps has to do with how little time he actually spent in the company in the grand scheme of things. He was certainly still a highlight through the rest of 2005 and in 2006, always acting like the biggest arsehole in the room in a tag and healing every step of the way. He even had a quite cool, albeit rather brief match in Ring of Honor against Brian Danielson, challenging for the latter's world title during Ring of Honor's two UK shows which took place at the same time as Sewer's 2006 British Summer Excursion that would also see him wrestle against Danielson in the short-lived One Pro Wrestling. However, at the start of 2007, Sewer surprised everyone by announcing that he wasn't just leaving Noah but that he was retiring from the ring completely. He had his last Noah match on January 21st, teaming with Minoru Suzuki and Yoshihiro Takayama in a losing effort against Kenta, Marafuji and Takeshi Rikio, before embarking on one final tour, the Japanese part of which ended with two bouts against Shuji Kondo and Sima. His actual final match, at least for a few years, happened at a Toyum on Mexico event, where Sura was part of an all-time heel team, himself, Misu, Takayama and Ultimo Guerrero. Here's something quite interesting mind you, the Rudos would lose on that night to a team of Ultimo Dragon, Mil Mascaris, Marco Corleone, you know Mark Jindrak, and a young 20 year old wrestler by the name of Kazuchika Okada, who did spend his first four years in the business largely on a Mexican excursion, pretty much under Ultimo Dragon's win. That's a nice little factoid. However, retirements aren't necessarily forever, certainly not in wrestling. Sua did come back in 2013 for Noah, wrestling under a mask as Maybuck Taniguchi Jr for the first couple months of his return. Indeed it wasn't until he lost to the senior Maybuck in a match that his true identity would be revealed. Most of this return would, funnily enough, be spent as a part of Kenta's heel No Mercy group. This pair, once absolutely heated rivals, were all of a sudden together. Alas, this return would be all too brief. Sua got injured again after a few months and once again decided to retire, this time for good. Another funny coincidence, Sua's final match to date, where he teamed with regular partner Gemba Hirianagi in a loss to Atsushi Kotoge and Taiji Ishimori, took place on the 11th of May 2013 on the final burning card at the Budokan. Yes, Sua had his last match on the same night that Kenta Kabashi had his last match. I think that the relatively brief nature of Sua's career, only 10 and a bit years when you add it all up, probably counts towards him still being not as well known as he should be compared to a lot of other more high profile heels and junior wrestlers, which is a bit of a shame. Still you can't necessarily blame someone for getting out of the business before those injuries pile up way too much and your quality of life gets badly affected, which presumably is exactly what Sua decided to do. The case for Sua being one of the great heels can be made throughout his career, but a lot of it does indeed have to do with this one match, it is his absolute finest hour, the one match that you have to watch to see everything that the guy is all about. For the other guy in the win, Kenta, this is of course one great match of many that he's had over the years in a glittering career, but even then there's been times when he's been on the sidelines too. This remains one of the very best matches of his first golden period, I suppose, when he was much more of a pretty fan favourite high flyer as opposed to the more strike heavy, arrogant heel he usually plays nowadays. Hell, is it a reach to say that Kenta eventually kind of turned into Sua? 
that when he became the worst outsider, he was channeling his old rival? Did this story have that much of an effect? Now that's all projection and reaching, of course. But hey, such analysis is one of the fun things about looking at wrestling and wondering if a story like this one can still have an impact on a guy like Kenta in storyline all of these years later. But hopefully you've enjoyed this look back at a classic, and stay tuned because there'll be more coming. But until then, bye for now.